Hi, my name is Tom Chang, and I'm an Associate Professor of Finance and Business Economics at the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. Over the past few months, the novel coronavirus COVID-19 has swept across the world, upending lives and devastating the global economy. As the cost in human lives has grown exponentially, governments have increasingly turned to extreme measures like stay-at-home orders in an attempt to slow the spread of the virus and to reduce the number of people who will get sick from this disease. Infectious disease specialists and health policy researchers warn that without such measures, hospitals will be overrun and the death toll in the U.S. could reach into the millions. But the economic cost of these preventative measures is growing, and some are beginning to wonder if the cure is worse than the disease. We, as a society, have some truly consequential decisions to make about how to best respond to the current coronavirus epidemic. As governments, businesses, and communities struggle to figure out the best way to deal with the novel coronavirus, a key decision that needs to be made is how to balance the risk to human lives to the risk to livelihoods. That is, how do we balance the public health versus the negative economic consequences of measures designed to save lives? Today, I want to talk to you about a widely used economic tool called the value of a statistical life that provides one answer to this difficult question. When most people think about economics, they think about money or about the production and consumption of goods and services. While technically correct, this definition is somewhat misleading. At its heart, economics is really the study of scarcity or the efficient allocation of limited resources. If we didn't have scarcity, we would all have everything we want, whenever we wanted, with all the time in the world to enjoy it. We would have enough N95 masks and ventilators and test kits for everyone who needed one, and the money to make whole anyone who's economically hurt by measures designed to fight this epidemic. But unfortunately, we do not live in that world. Not in normal times, and definitely not now. While the terminology may be unfamiliar to some, the idea of scarcity news trade-offs is something we are all familiar with. In the real world, we can't have all the things. Instead, we need to make compromises or trade-offs in an attempt to bring to our lives the most joy possible, subject to our limited means. We do this naturally, every day. For example, should you get the bigger house, or settle for the smaller one that leaves enough money in the budget for a nice vacation every year? or should you get that $4 Frappuccino now or save up for a night out with your friends? The principle of scarcity and trade-offs applies to human life as well. The very idea that we can put a dollar value on human life is distasteful to most and unethical to many. But in a world with limited resources, it is something that we all do every day. For example, how much more are you willing to pay for a safety feature, say a new and improved airbag, that reduces your chances of dying in a car crash? Or, how much more would an employer have to pay a worker to take a job with a given risk of death? By studying how people make millions of decisions like these, economists can estimate the dollar value we, as a society, put on a human life, based not just on our words, but on our actions. This estimate is called the value of a statistical life, or VSL for short. What VSL is not is a measure of a person's lifetime wages, or economic productivity, or intrinsic worth. Rather, it is simply a measure of how much the average person is willing to pay to reduce the risk of death. VSL estimates are widely used in the U.S. and other countries to determine the cost and benefits of health, safety, and environmental regulations. Simply put, putting a dollar value on human life, however distasteful, is a necessary step in order to determine the cost-benefit trade-offs of important policy decisions, including how much damage we should be willing to inflict on the economy to prevent the spread of COVID-19. While there is no hard and fast figure for VSL in the U.S., most estimates put the current number at above $10 million per person, with the number decreasing with the person's age. This variation by age is important because the death rate for COVID-19 increases significantly with age. VSL by age can then be combined with either the current statistics about coronavirus or projections about the future spread of the disease to determine the value of lives lost in economic terms. To help people understand this important economic tool, USC Marshall has developed a web-based interactive calculator that puts a dollar figure to the epidemiological projections that have been all over the news. This calculator is available for free on the USC Marshall website. Our hope is that it will help policymakers, business leaders, and the general public get a better sense of the trade-offs inherent in the decisions we will be making over the next few months. Given that the situation is rapidly evolving, the scenarios and assumptions that go into the calculator will change over time 
as we learn more about the effects of the disease and our response to it. And we will update the VSL calculator to take into account the latest scientific findings. But as of now, if we combine the age-adjusted VSL with the projection from infectious disease specialists and public health experts, we find that the economic cost of lives lost if we were to treat this just like the flu is projected to be between $6.5 and $8.5 trillion. On the high end, this number represents over 40% of US GDP. On the low end, it's larger than the GDP of every country on Earth, with the exception of the United States and China. Given how little we know about COVID-19, any estimate like this will necessarily contain a high degree of uncertainty. But its sheer magnitude indicates that not taking strong and aggressive action now could very well lead to a multi-trillion dollar catastrophe. To be sure, we aren't doing nothing, and the economic costs of combating the corona epidemic are already large and mounting. And it is possible to reach a point where the cost of the cure exceeds the benefits. But one also has to be very careful in separating out the economic impact of the coronavirus itself from the economic effects of government and community action designed to fight the spread of the virus. That is, not all the economic damage from corona is due to government intervention. Some is based on people's response to the disease itself. And that is something that won't change until we have the coronavirus under control. As just one example, data from OpenTable, a nationwide restaurant reservation platform, shows that in states that require restaurants to close, year-over-year -year numbers of reservations had already dropped by more than 50% before the closures went into effect. Moreover, reservations are currently down by 70 to 80% for restaurants in states without closure orders. That is, the corona epidemic itself causes so many people to avoid restaurants even in the absence of regulatory intervention that if we take the open table numbers at face value, an additional month of forced closure is economically less costly to the average restaurant than if allowing them to stay open leads to the pandemic sticking around for an additional two months. One thing I want to make perfectly clear is that there is a real cost to hurting the economy, and that this cost will be measured not just in unemployment filings, GDP growth, and shrunken 401ks, but also in lives lost and suffering endured. Human history has shown that making people economically better off is the most reliable way to better the human condition. Whether you're talking about physical health, happiness, or life expectancy, both within and across countries. Over the past 100 years, economic prosperity has been the rising tide that raised all boats. Life and livelihood are inextricably linked. And in a world with limited resources, Whenever we make the choice to do something, it means we can do less of something else. Or, as the old Christian Children's Fund commercials would say, for the price of a cup of coffee a day, you could be feeding a hungry child. While at this moment in time, I think strong and significant action is called for to fight the corona epidemic, it is clearly possible to go too far. As an example, I want to talk about the Fukushima nuclear disaster. On March 11, 2011, 43 miles off the east coast of Japan, a 9.0 magnitude megathrust earthquake took place. The earthquake, which is the most powerful ever recorded in earthquake-prone Japan, generated powerful tsunami waves that soon hit the coast. Traveling at speeds of up to 435 miles per hour and reaching heights of 130 feet, these waves devastated parts of Japan up to 6 miles inland, killing 16,000 people. When these waves reached the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Akuma, they easily breached the protective wall surrounding the plant and led to the largest nuclear disaster since Chernobyl back in 86. In the days following the Fukushima breach, over 100,000 residents were ordered to evacuate the area. And while residents raced to escape the deadly radiation leaking from the compromised plant, nearly 600 people still died. Actually, I said that wrong. What I meant to say was that because 100,000 residents quickly fled the area, 573 people died. To date, only a single death has been attributed to radiation exposure from the Fukushima nuclear breach, and that was of a worker in charge of measuring the radiation levels at the reactor shortly after its meltdown. Rather, 573 people, mostly old and in poor health, died not because of radiation exposure due to the breach, but because of the physical and mental stress of the evacuation itself combined with lack of access to healthcare. This is not to say that radiation sickness from nuclear meltdowns is fake news. 
Radiation absolutely can have a significant negative effect, as Chernobyl showed. But in this particular case, where the lifetime radiation-induced cancer risk among the evacuees is considered likely too small to even measure, the anxiety and panic caused by fear of leaking radiation cause far more harm than the radiation itself. Indeed, in their postmortem, the WHO concluded that the evacuation was a costly mistake, not just economically, but in terms of lives lost and the overall mental and physical health of the evacuated population. Which brings me to my final point. G-I-G-O, or garbage in, garbage out. It's easy for me to Monday morning quarterback the Japanese government and say that the evacuation of Fukushima was the wrong thing to do. But the only reason I know this is that we have solid, reliable data about the incident. G-I-G-O is a reminder that no matter how good the epidemiological or economic models are, if the assumptions going into the model are bad, then our ability to calculate the cost of different potential actions are necessarily going to be poor. Back in mid-March, I co-wrote an op-ed in which we argued the VSL estimates provided an economic rationale for the U.S. to take strong and immediate action against COVID-19. While such actions would cause significant harm to the economy, we showed that from a cold dollars and cents perspective, the alternative was much worse. Given the potential dollar cost of lives lost, the economic efficient thing to do, at least temporarily, was to prioritize measures designed to fight the spread of COVID-19 while simultaneously providing significant economic assistance to help those who are disproportionately affected by such measures. Although the calculation was based on the best estimates available at the time, it came with a huge dose of uncertainty as the mortality rate of COVID-19 back then was not known with any degree of precision. Thus, my position was based not on a certainty that the epidemiological projections were correct, but rather out of a concern that they might be. My hope was that through randomized testing and other means, we would soon have a much better handle on things like the mortality rate. From there, we could start to accurately calculate the relevant trade-offs and make the hard but necessary decisions regarding our response to this disease with some degree of confidence. Weeks later, as I record this talk while sheltering in home, we have surpassed China to become the country with the most confirmed cases of COVID-19, but we still don't have good enough data on many aspects of this disease. Currently, many places in the U.S. do not have enough test kits to test all those who are suspected of having COVID-19, much less the testing capacity to implement the sort of research designs necessary to get the answers we need. In many ways, we are still flying half-blind, making life-altering decisions based on educated guesses. But we must do the best we can with what we have, and I am hopeful that as new data comes in, we can do better. And tools like the VSL will play an important role in helping us determine the best way to respond to this epidemic in a rational and thoughtful way. In these trying times when faced with only bad choices, we must all strive to figure out the least worst thing. Stay safe and thanks for watching.